Good day viewers, welcome to Henry's Impact and today we're going to be talking and emphasizing on the diversities and characteristics of animals. We're going to be expatiating on some basic phenomena and some mechanisms in diversification of animals. You understand? So make sure you hit the subscribe button and like the video, drop your comments in the comment section so that we can improve more on the videos. Alright then. Diversities and characteristics of animals. You must know that in our world today and from historical times that we can count a billion of species of different organisms out of which close to um, hundreds of millions have gone extinct. Now these different organisms tend to pose or show different characteristics and you get these characteristics are responsible for the diversification you find out that the characteristics of this species is different from the characteristics of another species. Are you getting me now? So, and that reason is what it brings about the necessity of classification of the organisms. We will be expatiating more in our later videos in taxonomy and systematics. Okay, also classification and stuff. All right. Now we said classification system characterizes animals based on their anatomy, morphology, and evolutionary history. Now, this is what we're trying to say. You classify organisms based on certain, um, certain guidelines or certain base of grounds, you understand? Um, and such, um, some of those characteristics of base of character and uh, classification are anatomy, the morphology, when we say the anatomy, that means we're talking about the internal, the differences in the internal structures or build up of different species of organisms. Then we'll also look at the morphology. The morphology, we're looking at the external build up of that organism. You know, different organisms, they have different external build up. Then we'll look at the evolutionary history. The evolutionary history, we'll take, check, try to check the ancestral makeup of that organism. What ancestors did this organism come from? So that's another base of this classification or characterization. Then we we'll look at the features of the embryological development and their genetic makeup. So these are the bases on which animals are characterized. These are the bases of which animals are characterized. Now animals have some general characteristics. They tend to show some general characteristics. And number one we have here that all animals are eukaryotes. And when we say eukaryotes, what we mean we're saying that all uh, organisms that have true nucleus and nuclear membrane, you understand that nucleus are membranous, and we must think that all animals are actually eukary eukaryotic, you understand? And that's why they fall under the domain eukarya, which I'll be talking and especially more on later. Now we now have they are multicellular. When you say multicellular, that means they are not one cell, they have many cells which will lead to organization of life. Then we also have, they have complex tissues. They have complex tissues and they are heterotrophic. Now when we say they are heterotrophic, meaning that all animals do not show the capability to produce their food by themselves. You understand? All they do is that they depend on other organisms for their food. That's what we mean by heterotrophic. And on that basis, you cannot look at heterotrophic nutrition in some criteria. For you to be heterotrophic, that means that animal can either be carnivore flesh eaters, and can you that be an herbivore that is help eaters or plant eaters, then you can also have your omnivores, those that feed on both animals as flesh and herbs as plants. Then you can also have them as parasites. Like one of the major parasites you have to take note as as a biologist is your is your Dirofilaria, the Dirofilaria imitis, the Dirofilaria imitis, which is the uh, binomial name for your heartworm, for your heartworm. So this Dirofilaria imitis, which we say is another name for heartworm, they actually infest the heart of dogs and some mammals. You understand causing pathological and physiological changes in the standard abnormalities in that organism in the cardiological buildup of that organism that's what we call it heartworm and the scientific name is dirofilaria imitis 
tyro failure and rare illnesses. So, when we're talking about um, heterotrophic, now we have to know that animals lack cell walls. We know in their build up, their cellular build up, they, have, they lack cell walls. What they have present is cell membrane. They lack cell walls. Right, that they have cell membrane. Now, the cells are embedded in an extracellular matrix such as either bones, skins, or connective tissues. Now, animal cells have gap junctions. Now, between cells of um, an animal, you have these spaces that are connected together, bridged, and we call those spaces gap junction, and they are necessary for intercellular communication. That's the reason for gap junction. So, animals have inter um, gap junctions that are responsible for intercellular communication. That is transport of what of information or materials from one cell to another cell. That the gap junction allows such communication. Okay, animal cells have gap junctions, and um, the various tissue possessed by animals are modified and adapted to perform specific functions. You know, we have different categories of tissues. We have your epithelial tissues. We have your connective tissues. You know that your epithelial tissues the line the surface of what of certain organs such as your um, your intestine, you get the, your, your trochae, your sophagus, they are lined with epithelial tissue. And you also have your connective tissues that you find in your bones and your muscles, the aid in support. You understand? And all this system, all these processes or characteristics shown by animals just actually aid in what we call coordination, which is carried out by what the nerve tissue coordination carried out by the nerve tissue which will now be aiding motility of the organisms the organism ability to move you understand around which is responsible um, uh, which is carried out by your what by your muscular tissue and your skeletal system all right so we've been able to talk about this we've been able to brush through some characteristics of animals we've been able to say that they are prokaryotic you understand so let's quickly take a look at what we have here now, we know that animals are morphologically classified based on the symmetry type. Now, we're looking at the basis of the classification of animals. What are the basis used in the classification of animals? Animals are morphologically classified on the basis of symmetry type. When we say the symmetry type, that's the type of symmetry exhibited by that animal. Now, what do we really mean by a symmetry of an organism? That's the balance axis of the body of the organism. That axis through which the body of the organism balances. You get that's what we call symmetry. So that's one of the basis for the classification of organisms. Then we also have the number of tissue layers formed during development. You understand? I will be explaining the process called grastulation. You understand? In one of our videos, you'll be able to understand what we mean by formation, the process of the formation of this tissue layers. I was going to talk about it right here in this video. Now, we also have the absence or presence of internal body cavity. Absence or presence of internal body cavity and the body cavity, we actually call them coelum during the development process. We call it the coelum, C or L. So, now, and other features of embryological development, such as the origin of the mouth and the anus. So we're going to be looking at how these factors I just mentioned, symmetry type, the number of tissue layers, the development of those tissue layers, the absence or presence of internal body cavity, and what the embryological development, such as was formation of mouth and anus. We're going to be discussing each and every one of them, you understand, as a characteristic of animals. So we're going to look at the first one, animal characterization based on symmetry. I already defined symmetry to you. I said that symmetry is a line of axis which an organism body tends to be balanced. Now we have three kinds of organisms based on their symmetry. Animals are divided into three categories based on their symmetry. We have the radial symmetrical organisms, we have the bilateral symmetrical organisms, and we have the asymmetrical organisms. Now your radial symmetrical organisms, these are organisms that have their axis that will produce identical pairs when they are caught across or divided across any axis, you understand? For example, now you have orange, when you divide orange into two, you understand? You have this layer in which any axis to which you cut it from, you have an identical pair of that organism. So we said that in radial symmetry, there is arrangement around a central axis. In radial symmetry, there is arrangement around a central axis, 
in the stand, just like your sea animals and jellyfish. Your sea animals and jellyfish, they exhibit radial symmetry. They are all both radiators. They exhibit radial symmetries. Now, what about your bilateral symmetry? Your bilateral symmetry occurs when um, you have two identical um, parts of that organism after division. Now, that division usually takes place in the medial sagittal plane. Now, look at me. As you look at me right now, um, division, the plane that divides me like this into left and right is called a sagittal plane. Now, it does not necessarily have to be from the center. Like, if I divide myself from here, I still divide myself into left and right plane. But to have identical parts, you have to divide from the center, and that's what they call the medial sagittal plane. So the plane in which you divide an organism to have two identical parts of that organism is called the what? Bilateral symmetry. This kind of organisms have bilateral symmetry, and that plane is called the medial sagittal plane. All right. So organisms, most of your mammals, they, they, they have what we call bilateral symmetry. But your asymmetrical organisms are complex organisms that do not show symmetry. You understand? They show no symmetrical properties. And the basic organism or the major organism that shows asymmetrical properties are your sponges. They are your sponges, which we refer to as the poriferas. They are your sponges, which we refer to as the poriferas. We refer to them as the poriferas. Alright, so that's that for that. Now we must take note of that, that your echinodermatas, your echinodermatas, these organisms actually show bilateral symmetry at their larval stage. You know, your echinodermatas, such as your um, Olothrodia, your um, seawater lily, your starfish, you know, they show what we call bilateral symmetry during their larval stage. But as they grow to become adults, they begin to show what we call, what we call radial symmetry. They show radial symmetry just majorly as seen in your starfish. All right, then we have animal characterization based on features of embryological development. Based on features of embryological development, I'll quickly just explain the process of gastulation. Now, it all begins with the cleavage of the zygote. Now, the zygote begins to divide. And it begins to form cells that we call blastula. These blastulas are six to thirty-two cell um, 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 structures, you understand, that will now further divide and rearrange. When they divide and rearrange, they will be forming what we call a grastula, and that is responsible for the um, division of the organism or possession of the organism to have two, um, two or three gem layers, you understand, which we can also call tissue layers. Understand? So, that process I just explained briefly is the process of gastulation. So, the formation of these body layers occurs during gastulation. We said during gastulation, the process by which a blastula, which is 6 to 32 cells, is further divided and rearranged to form a gastula that develops into various gem layers. You understand? That's what we call gastulation. And it's the gastulation process that enables us to form those gem layers. Now, organisms can be divided into two based on the type of gastulation that takes place in or the formation of their gem layer. We have the diploblastic organisms and we have the triploblastic organisms. The diploblastic organisms and the triploblastic organisms. Just as the name implies, your diploblastic organisms, these are organisms that have two gem layers. They are organisms that have two gem layers. And what are those two gem layers? They are, we have the endoderm. We have the endoderm. And we have the ectoderm. Those are the two gem layers that we have. The endoderm and the ectoderm. Those are the two gem layers present in your diploblastic animals. But in your triploblastic animals, you have three gem layers. We have the endoderm, we have the mesoderm, and we have the ectoderm. Those are the three gem layers. Now, when you hear the word endo, endo means within. So, endoderm are the body gem layers that are found right inside, they're found right inside of the organism doing development, and biological development. Then your ectoderm, you find them um, outside, outside, that the outermost gem layer. Then your mesoderm is the middle gem layer. Now each of these gem layer tends to, or tends to form or grow to mature into different parts of that body or different structures. Now your ectoderm usually 
um, during the embryological level, you call them ectoderm, but as development occurs, your ectoderm begins to form all the outer epithelial tissues and your central nervous system. Definitely, you know, in the outermost part, for example, in humans, you have your epithelial tissue in the start, which I give you have the outer line of the epithelial tissue in the, your body, and you also have the internal epithelial tissue. So, it gives your ectoderm, we said, is the outermost part, right? So, they form the outer epithelial and the CNS, which is your central nervous system. Now, the endoderm grows or develops to form the lining of the internal organs. The lining of the internal organs, that's what your endoderm go to form. Then your mesoderm, those are the ones that form the muscle tissues, the connective tissues, the visceral organs, such as your kidney and your spleen. You get that now? All right. Now, let me quickly explain this structure to you. Since we said our ectoderm is the outermost layer, it means this section here is our ectoderm. This section there is our ectoderm. Understand? Now remember this gastrulation process is it aids in the formation of our guts, that the digestive guts you get. So this centralized region here, this centralized region is called the guts. Are you getting me now? That's called the guts. Then this place, this inner region that is just surrounding the guts, which is the innermost gem layer, is called we refer to it as our endoderm. We said it already. Endoderm. And in this particular one, you have another layer that we call the mesoderm. We have another layer we call the mesoderm. Let me write it properly. The mesoderm. Good. But right now you'll be wondering, um, you can send that empty layer here. Yeah, true. There's another layer here. But this is a layer or a cavity that you find non-living cavity, non-living empty cavity. You have that in your diploblast. You always have this portion here in your diploblast. Alright then. Now, your triploblast now can now be further divided into another category, three categories, based on their cavity, based on the possession of cavity, which we'll be calling a cellum, which we'll be calling a cellum. You can further divide them into um, three categories based on um, the possession of a cellum. And now we can see we have the acellumates. We have the oocelomates and we have the pseudocelomates. The acelomates, the oocelomates, and the pseudocelomates. So those are the three um, um, divisions that we have from our triploblast. Those are the three divisions we have from our triploblast. And I said this division is based on the possession of a body cavity, which we call a serum. Now, it's very it's when you word acelomates. A cellulite are organisms that do not have what? They don't have body cavity. They don't have cavity in the stand around their organs or you know, visceral organs or during the process of embryological development. In the stand, they don't have true cavity. They don't have any cavity. They don't have a cellum. But your cellulite, they possess that body cavity. In the stand, you have something like this. Let's draw this. this let this be the. Um, got now from here you now have a region right here. You see this is endoderm. Now I have a region right here. Now this region right here and then this piece I will call the cavity. 